Hello and welcome. Today let's move through our senses and sensory physiology and let's talk about the ear and we'll look at hearing and we'll look at balance. Now when we move through and we talk about uh, the ear, we'll look at again hearing and balance and uh, when we talk about the ear, we'll go through the structure of the ear first and then we'll move into the physiology. So the ear is going to be divided into three regions. The ear gets divided into three regions. You have the external ear, the outer ear it's also known as, and we'll see it's involved with only hearing. And we have our middle ear. Our middle ear is also known as our tympanic cavity, and it's going to be also involved with hearing only. And then we talk internal ear. Our internal ear is going to be involved with both hearing and equilibrium. We're going to have receptors for hearing and balance that are going to be found inside the internal ear, and they're going to respond to separate stimuli. They are activated independently. Now, when we go through and we talk about the divisions, we'll look at the external ear first. So here you can see all three divisions. You've got the external ear. The external ear, I'm sure you learned from anatomy, includes the oracle and the external acoustic meatus. And then we talk middle ear, the tympanic cavity. You can appreciate that right inside of here. And then last, we have the internal ear, the labyrinth. You can see that right inside of here. Let's talk first of the external ear. So when we talk external ear, the external ear is going to consist of the oracle and the external acoustic meatus. The oracle functions to funnel sound waves into the external acoustic meatus. Sound waves entering the external acoustic meatus eventually hit the tympanic membrane, or what we call the eardrum. This is going to serve as the boundary between the outer and the middle ears. Sound waves make that eardrum, the tympanic membrane, vibrate. They make it vibrate. They make it move back and forth. The eardrum, in turn, transfers the sound energy to the tiny bones of the middle ear you see right inside of here, setting them then vibrating. No, the external ear, so oracle and external acoustic meatus. And in here you've got glands basically helping to produce wax, and that wax is there to help protect our external acoustic meatus from uh, bugs or anything else making its way into the ear. Next then here, I can't tell you uh, how common it is uh, for people to come in with compacted wax uh, as one source of uh, deafness. And... Um, uh, you know, or even uh, kids putting uh, uh, toys or other uh, uh, structures such as beads and peas or, you know, lots of different things into their ears and uh, nose. And... Next, then, let's talk about the middle ear. Now, when we talk about the middle ear, the middle ear is also known as the tympanic cavity. And it's going to be flanked laterally by the eardrum, the tympanic membrane, as we see here, and medially by this bony wall. And medially by this bony wall, that's going to have a couple of openings found in relation to it that we're going to go through and we're going to talk about. The first opening we're going to talk about is going to be the superiorly located oval window. And the second opening we're going to talk about is going to be the more inferiorly located round window. So the oval window we're going to be able to appreciate underneath the stapes. And the round window we've got right underneath here. And it's going to be covered by membrane. So let's focus in on that region there in greater detail. So the oracle, external acoustic meatus, uh, tympanic membrane we've got there. Uh, make sure you cover all those. And then here we've got the middle ear. And here you can appreciate then the round window and the oval window as we described being underneath the stapes. Now when we talk about the tympanic cavity, you can see here this tympanic cavity contains three bones. These three bones are three of the smallest bones in the body. And when we talk about the divisions, the axial and the appendicular division, they're a part of the axial division. right? That's the division that makes up the midline, basically, of the body. 
So these are three of the smallest bones of the body, and they're collectively going to be referred to as our auditory ossicles, our auditory ossicles. These bones now include, number one, we can see here, the malleus, which is shaped like a hammer. So first we have the malleus, and the malleus you can see is going to be found communicating with the tympanic membrane. Next then we have the incus. The incus takes on the shape of an anvil. And then third we have the stapes. The stapes takes on the shape of a stirrup. Now when we talk about this malleus, you can see the handle of the malleus is secured to the eardrum. And the base of the stapes fits into the oval window as we described. These ossicles, these ossicles are going to transmit the vibratory motion of the eardrum onto the oval window, which then in turn is going to set the fluids of the internal ear into motion, eventually exciting the hearing receptors that are found inside that internal ear. The round window is a membrane. It's kind of like a pressure relief valve, and it's going to allow the fluid inside the ear to move. And if it becomes unmovable, this is going to impair hearing. Next, we could move to then middle ear inflammation. Now, we talk otitis media. Otitis media, it's also known as middle ear inflammation. It happens quite commonly in children. And it's usually due to having short, more horizontal pharyngeal tympanic tubes. And also, we will see it's the most frequent cause of hearing loss in children. Most are treated with antibiotics. And we can also do a procedure called a myringotomy, in where we insert tubes to help relieve the pressure if it becomes severe. So here, then, what would happen is they would have tubes basically inserted in the tympanic membrane. Next and here we can see, we've gone through, we've talked about the three ossicles, three small bones in the tympanic cavity. We mentioned those. They're suspended by ligaments and joined by synovial joints. And we said that they're going to transmit the vibratory motion of the eardrum to the oval window. And then we have the tensor tympani and the stapedius muscle, which are going to contract reflexively in response to loud sounds to prevent damage to hearing receptors. Next, then let's move to the internal ear. When we talk about the internal ear, the internal ear has two major divisions. First, we have the bony labyrinth, which is going to be a system of tortuous channels that are going to be worming through the bone, and the membranous labyrinth. The membranous labyrinth is going to be a continuous series of membranous sacs and ducts within the bony labyrinth that follow its contours. The bony labyrinth is going to be filled with a fluid called perilymph. Perilymph is similar to CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, and it is continuous with it. The membranous labyrinth is suspended in the perilymph, and its interior contains endolymph, which is similar to potassium-rich intracellular fluid. These two fluids, they're going to conduct the sound vibrations that are involved in hearing, and they also respond to forces occurring during changes in body position and acceleration. And we'll see the bony labyrinth is going to have three regions to it, and they include the vestibule, the semicircular canals, and the cochlea. So let's jump back here and we can appreciate those three structures right inside of here. So here we can appreciate the vestibule. Second, then we've got our semicircular canals. And third, then we've got the cochlea. Let's look at these structures then in greater detail. We'll start off with the vestibule. Now, when we talk about the vestibule, I would like you to know that the vestibule is going to contain two membranous labyrinth sacs, the saccule and the utricle. So let's move from this picture over to this picture where we can actually appreciate the inside now. So here we've got two membranous labyrinth sacs. This is one right inside of here. This is the utricle. 
And the second one we can appreciate right in here is the saccule. The saccule and the utricle are going to be important because we'll see they house equilibrium receptor regions called maculae that respond to gravity and our head position. And here you can appreciate the maculae inside the utricle and the maculae inside the saccule. Next thing we can appreciate our semicircular canals. Our semicircular canals are going to contain an area called the ampulla, which is going to house an equilibrium receptor region that's called the crista ampullaris, you can see, in all three of the ampullae. These receptors we see here, they're going to respond to angular head movements. They respond to angular head movements. Next in here, let's appreciate the cochlea. The cochlea is going to contain the membranous cochlear duct, which houses the receptor organ for hearing, and it's called the spiral organ, or it's also known as the organ of corti. This cavity here we're going to see is divided into three separate chambers, or we can say into three scalae. And those scalae will include, first we've got the scala vestibuli. Second, then we're going to see we have the scala media. And third, we're going to have the scala tympani, which terminates at the membrane-covered round window inferior to this cochlear duct. Now let's unwind this cochlea. If we were to unwind this cochlea and then we were to make a cut through it, this is basically what we would be looking at there then. So if we were to get the cochlea, make a nice cut through it, these are the three different layers we would be looking at. So here you can see the scala vestibuli, the scala media, and the scala tympani. So let me take us back to this image right inside of here. So here let me show you, if we were to make a cut, this cut here, So here, let's draw everything out. Right here, we could see then, we're going to have the cochlea opened up, and when we open it up, it'll look something similar to this. And then let's draw in our membranous labyrinth. Then the membranous labyrinth will come in here, something similar to this. And then we said we have the spiral organ right on top of here, and that we can see right in here. Okay, and then here we have our round window, we said. It's covered by the membrane. And then we have our oval window, which is covered by the stapes, which then communicates with the incus, which then communicates with the malleus, which then is in contact with the tympanic membrane. And then here we have the ear. Okay, so this is where the sound is going to make its way into the tympanic membrane. So here you can see we have the oracle, external acoustic meatus. And then here we've got the tympanic membrane, the malleus, incus, stapes, round window. Incus, malleus, stapes, and oval window. And then in here we said we have the scala vestibuli, the scala tympani, and then in here we said the scala media. Okay, so this is the cochlea opened up, and now if we were to make a cut right through this cochlea, right through here like this, and then turn that around and we were to look at that, okay, so that's what you would see here. So in here what they've done is they've got the whole cochlea here wound up. If we were to unwind this cochlea 
And if we were to make that same cut, you could see we would be looking at these three layers in there. And this through these three layers here, we see they're continuing. And it's going all the way through, coming all the way through, all the way through, all the way through, all the way through, all the way to the end here. The end here is at the apex or the helicoterima. They're pointing it out to us right down here. For us here, it would be right up in here, right in this area. Okay, so here now with this whole cochlea opened up, you can see this is what we're, I'm showing you guys in that picture. You got the scala vestibuli, scala tympani at the bottom, and then here is the spiral organ, organ of corti found in relation to the scala media. Okay, so when sound comes in, it's going to make its way into the ear, okay? It makes its way into the ear, and then it's going to come in, it's going to vibrate this eardrum, and then it's going to get these bones in here moving, which then are going to start, we're going to see pushing up against the fluids that are going to be inside of the cochlea. So here then, let's talk more about this cochlea. Now the scala media, let's come to this picture here. The scala media is a part of the membranous labyrinth, Okay, the scala media, let's come back to this picture here too. You can see there the scala media, which is going to be in here. The scala media is a part of the membranous labyrinth. Therefore, it is filled with endolymph, the scala vestibuli, and the scala tympani. They are a part of the bony labyrinth, and they contain perilymph. So here we can see that from this picture also. Scala vestibuli and tympani, perilymph, endolymph in relation to the scala media. So that's what we're seeing here. We've got the scala vestibuli. So we've got perilymph then in relation to the scala tympani. Okay, we're going to see here they're communicating with each other. And then inside of here, we said we have endolymph. So we'll just put an E in here for endolymph. And the same thing you're seeing right in here. The scala vestibuli and the scala tympani are continuous with each other, you can see, at the apex, at that cochlear apex, or we can refer to it as the helicotrema. The roof of the cochlear duct is formed by the vestibular membrane, we can see right up in here. And then the floor is formed by the basilar membrane. The floor is formed by the basilar membrane, which is going to play a role in sound reception. The cochlear nerve is a division of the vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial nerve number 8, and it's going to run from this spiral organ, as we see here, to the brain. So this is one branch, the vestibulocochlear nerve, has a vestibular branch and a cochlear branch. Here's the cochlear branch. If we move back, you can appreciate the vestibular branch making its way over to the vestibule. Let's look at the spiral organ then in greater detail. So here you can see from this view, when we zoom in on it, this is what it's going to look like. You can see here, you've got a tectorial membrane, and we've got a basilar membrane, and in between the two we've got sandwiched, basically a whole bunch of hair cells. Let's check out then the physiology of sound. First I want you to understand that sounds are vibrations of air that beat against the eardrum that pushes a chain of tiny bones that presses fluid in the internal ear. Now the pushing forces pull on the tiny hair cells that stimulate nearby neurons that are going to give rise to impulses which then travel to the brain, which then interprets them and you hear. Now let's talk first the properties of sound. Sound is a pressure disturbance where we have alternating areas of high and low pressure. Sound is produced by a vibrating object and it's propagated by the molecules of air. Here we can see we've got a tuning fork and this tuning fork is struck and it vibrates from left to right and it produces a series of compression, high pressure areas, and rarefactions, low pressure areas, which are collectively called a sound wave that moves outward in all directions. 
So here we can see compressions and rarefactions, basically areas of high pressure and low pressure. Sound is described in terms of two physical properties, frequency and we'll see amplitude. First, let's talk frequency. When we talk frequency, frequency is going to be defined as the number of waves that pass a given point in a given time. The distance between two consecutive crests or troughs is the wavelength of the sound. So the crests you can see are the tops of the wave, and then the troughs are the bottoms of the wave. So again, the distance between two consecutive crests or troughs is the wavelength of the sound. Next, then, let's talk about pitch and quality. When we talk pitch, pitch is the perception of different frequencies. The normal range is anywhere from 20 to 200 hertz, and higher frequency equals higher pitch. Next, when we talk quality, we'll see most sounds are mixtures of different frequencies. And we talk richness and complexity of sounds, that's music. Next, then let's talk amplitude. When we talk amplitude, we're talking about the height of the wave. So when we talk about the height of the wave, the height of the wave is going to reveal a sound's intensity, which we'll see is going to be related to its energy. Loudness, we'll see, is going to be our subjective interpretation of sound's intensity. Sound intensity and loudness can be measured in units called decibels. So here we can see the normal range is anywhere from 0 to 120 decibels. However, you can see we can have hearing loss with prolonged exposure to sounds over 90 decibels. Amplified rock music is about 120 decibels or more. Next then, let's check out the transmission of sound to the internal ear. So here we'll start off, we can see in order to hear sound waves, they must be propagated through the air, through our membranes, through our bones, and our fluids to stimulate receptor cells in the spiral organ. So here we can see sound entering the external acoustic meatus is going to strike the tympanic membrane. When it strikes the tympanic membrane, it's going to set that tympanic membrane vibrating at the same frequency. The greater the intensity, the farther the membrane is going to be displaced. And then number two, we can see the motion of the tympanic membrane is amplified and transferred to the oval window by the ossicles. The ossicles are going to act like a hydraulic press or like pistons, you can say. And they're going to transfer the same total force hitting the eardrum to the oval window. The pressure exerted is actually 20 times that compared to what it was on the tympanic membrane. Because this pressure is going to help overcome the stiffness of the cochlear fluid to set it into a wave-like motion. So three, then here we can see, we're going to have a resonance of the basilar membrane. Our scala vestibuli come into play. So here as the stapes moves back and forth against the oval window, it sets the perilymph in the scala vestibuli into a similar motion. Now you can see a pressure wave is going to travel through the perilymph. It goes from the basal end towards the helicoterema. Since fluids cannot be compressed, we'll see each time the stapes forces fluid onto the oval window, the membrane of the round window bulges laterally and acts as a pressure valve. Next, then we talk sounds of very low frequency. When we talk sounds of very low frequency, we'll see they're going to create pressure waves that are going to take the complete route through the cochlea. 
meaning they go up the scala vestibuli, around the helicoterema, and down the scala tympani back towards the round window. These low frequency sounds, they do not activate the spiral organ, and so they are below the range of hearing. Next then, let's talk about the basilar membrane path. Now here, sounds with frequencies high enough to hear are going to create pressure waves that take a shortcut. They're going to take a shortcut and they're going to be transmitted through the cochlear duct into the perilymph of the scala tympani, vibrating the entire basilar membrane, activating hair cells, which are going to be the receptor cells, causing action potentials then to be sent to the brain. Now let's look at sounds of different frequencies. So here we'll see when we talk high frequency sounds, high frequency sounds are going to displace the basilar membrane near the base. When we talk medium frequency sounds, we can see they're going to displace the basilar membrane near the middle. And then low frequency sounds, they displace the basilar membrane near the apex. Let's check out then the excitation of our hair cells. Now here we can appreciate the spiral organ again, the organ of Corti we said. The spiral organ or the organ of Corti we can see here is going to be found resting on top of the basilar membrane, which again we can find right down here. And it's going to be composed of supporting cells. You can appreciate there. And amongst those supporting cells, we've got receptor cells that are called cochlear hair cells. The hair cells we can see are arranged as one row of inner hair cells and three rows of outer hair cells that are sandwiched in between the tectorial membrane we see right up in here and the basilar membrane we see down here. The hair cells have numerous stereocilia or long microvilli which protrude into the potassium-rich endolymph. Which protrude into the potassium-rich endolymph. Transduction of sound stimuli occurs after localized movements of the basilar membrane. So that's very important you understand that. Transduction of sound stimuli occurs after localized movements of the basilar membrane tweak the stereocilia of the hair cells. We'll see bending the stereocilia towards the tallest stereocilia opens cation channels in the adjacent stereocilia, resulting in an inward potassium and calcium current and a depolarization or a receptor potential being generated. So again... Bending the stereocilia towards the tallest stereocilia opens cation channels. Now, bending the stereocilia towards the shortest stereocilia is going to close the gated ion channels, repolarizing the cells. Depolarization increases calcium and increases the hair cells' release of neurotransmitter glutamate. Now, when we look at the role of the outer hair cells, we can see here these cells, they're going to get innervated by efferent fibers that convey messages from the brain to the ear. These cells, they help to change the stiffness of the basilar membrane. So here we can see that again. Sound bending towards the tallest cilium, the kinocilium is going to open mechanically gated ion channels. Next in here we can see the auditory pathway to the brain. Impulses from the cochlea are going to pass via spiral ganglion to the cochlear nuclei of the medulla. And then from there we can see impulses are going to be sent to the superior olivary nucleus via the lateral lemniscus to the inferior colliculus. And then from there the impulse is going to pass to the medial geniculate nucleus of the thalamus then to the primary auditory cortex. And you will be able to see here in a few seconds, the auditory pathways are going to decussate so that both cortices are going to receive input from both ears. So here you can see all the fibers are traveling. They're making their way all the way up. And then here we have the decussation occur.
Let's move on then to equilibrium. Let's talk equilibrium and orientation. The equilibrium receptors of the vestibular apparatus can be divided into two functional arms. You'll see the receptors in the vestibule, they monitor linear acceleration and the position of the head with respect to gravity or our static equilibrium. The semicircular canals monitor changes in head rotation called our sense of dynamic equilibrium. Our maculae, our maculae are going to be our static equilibrium receptors. And they're going to be sensory receptor organs that monitor the position of the head in space. And so they're going to play a role in controlling posture. They respond to linear acceleration and horizontal movements. That is basically changes in straight line speed and direction, but not in rotation. Now let's look at the anatomy of the macula. Here we can see each macula is going to contain hair cells which are supported by supporting cells. The hair cells are embedded in an overlying otolithic membrane we can see here. This otolithic membrane we can see is going to embed all of the stereocilia. So now here you can see in greater detail we've got the stereocilia and then we've got one kinocilium in the bundle as well. And they're all embedded by this membrane, which have a whole bunch of otoliths on top of it. Now let's talk about activating the maculae receptors. We'll see when your head starts or stops moving, inertia causes this otolithic membrane to slide forward and backwards, bending those hair bundles, bending those hair cells, which causes neurotransmitter then to be released. Now more specifically speaking, we'll see when the hairs bend towards the kinocilium, the hair cells depolarize. They depolarize and we have an increase in neurotransmitter release occur. Now when the hairs bend away from the kinocilium, the receptors hyperpolarize and release of neurotransmitter is going to decrease. So here we can appreciate then how each macula is going to be found in the saccule and its position then in the utercle. You can see one is more vertical compared to the other. All right, next then let's move forward and let's check out then our crista ampullaris. Now we check out our crista ampullaris, they're going to be our dynamic equilibrium receptors. They are our receptors for rotational acceleration and they're going to be found in the ampulla of each semicircular canal. Let's look at the anatomy. Here we can see each crista is composed of supporting cells. We can appreciate right inside of here. And we've got some hair cells. And the hair cells have their hair bundles here as well. And their hair bundles now you can see are embedded in a cupula. And they are embedded, we can see, in the cupula. Now let's talk about activating the crista ampullaris receptors. The crista are going to respond to changes in the velocity of rotational movements of the head. We'll see because of inertia, the endolymph moves causing the hair cells to bend and depolarize, sending messages to the brain. So here we can see this young lady is uh, exhibiting some rotational movements. And here at rest, the cupula is standing upright. So we can see that during rotational acceleration, endolymph moves inside the semicircular canals in the direction opposite to rotation. It lags behind due to the inertia. Endolymph flow bends the cupula and then it excites the hair cells, sending signals to the brain, letting it know that the body is turning. And then we'll see as rotational movements begin to slow, Endolymph is going to keep moving, and it's going to keep moving now in the direction of rotation. Endolymph flow bends the cupula in the opposite direction from acceleration, and then it inhibits the hair cells, letting the brain know, all right, we're starting to slow down. So here then we can see the exact same thing. 
Next, then let's talk about motion sickness. Now, when we talk motion sickness, it's described as being sensory input mismatches. Here we'll see we have visual input differing from equilibrium input and conflicting information that is going to cause motion sickness. And we can see there's some warning signs, and they'll include excessive salivation, pallor, rapid deep breathing, and profuse sweating. And when we talk treatment, treatment is going to be with anti-motion drugs that are going to depress the vestibular input, such as meclizine and scopolamine. Next thing we can talk, homeostatic imbalances of hearing. We have conducting deafness and sensory neural deafness. When we talk conduction deafness, it's where you have blocked sound conduction to fluids of the internal ear. It could be due to impacted earwax or a perforated eardrum, otitis media, and autosclerosis. When we talk sensory neural deafness now, it could be due to damage of the neural structures at any point from the cochlear hair cells to the auditory cortical cells. And it's typically from gradual hair cell loss. And then last, we can talk treating deafness. Research is trying to prod supporting cell differentiation into hair cells to treat sensory neural deafness. We also have cochlear implants for congenital or age or noise cochlear damage. And what the implants do is they convert sound energy into electrical signals. They're going to be inserted into drilled recesses in the temporal bone. And they're so effective that deaf children can learn to speak.